BTW, Brian Austin Green and Mark Paul Gossier, whatever, can still freaking get it. They are handsome. Hey, everybody. Welcome to a bonus episode of Long Story Short, the podcast. I'm Megan. I'm Wendy. Normally, this would be a Hallmark recap episode, but much to Wendy's extreme delight, there is a break (laughs) in the Hallmark original programming this week. So instead of taking a week off, we decided to take a sharp left turn, and we're going to be discussing the new documentary on Hulu, Kid 90. While you're here, we would love it if you would take a minute to let us know if you love the podcast by leaving a review in Apple Podcasts. A recent review from Alice and Clara says, it's just like hanging out with your best friends. Just subscribed and am obsessed. I heard about Megan and Wendy from Deck the Hallmark podcast and have binge listened all day. It's like hanging out with my best girlfriends. They're hilarious, honest, so much fun. And friends, we've made it so easy for you to leave a review. Just visit meganandwendy.com slash Apple Podcast, and it will take you right there. That link is also going to be available in our show notes. Uh, you can also send us your emails at meganandwendy at gmail.com. We love to read them. We sometimes share them here on the show. And Megan has one for us today. So this email is from Sheila, and it is based on a conversation we had last week on our Hallmark episode where we discussed the Hallmark series When Calls the Heart, and Wendy said she would never, ever watch, and I have not yet watched, but I'm still open to it. Yeah, you're a big talker, because you said last week, I'm going to watch it. I think I'm going to watch it, and I was like, no, 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 no. So why haven't you watched it yet, then? Because I've probably watched three hours of TV in the last seven days. Okay. Okay. So that'd be the reason. But Sheila says, mm -hmm. the series is based on a book series by Janet or Jeanette Oak. I grew up in a very conservative evangelical circle and her books were it for romantic novels. She was quite (laughs) prolific. I'm sure they toned down the Christian themes for TV, but it's definitely perfect for Hallmark. That really confirms everything I thought about the show. That's that's the image it gives me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not doing it for me. I'm sorry. I'm honestly still open to it, but we uh I'm not putting a timeline on it, guys. How long is how many episodes are in one season of that show? I have no idea. My feeling is that there are many seasons of the show just based on how often I see it being promoted. It seems like yeah. it's been on for a while. They, It has been. And I know that uh, previous seasons were available, I believe, on Netflix, but that has since expired. One season is on Hallmark Movies now and one season is on the Fubo app. What the heck is Fubo? <laughs> I've never even heard of that. And you can also buy it on Amazon. So maybe okay. I won't be watching it because I'm definitely not buying it. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to pay for it. Right. I don't blame you. I do not. As mentioned, we are discussing Kid 90 this week, which is a documentary on Hulu, and it consists of Soleil Moon Fries, home movies, diary entries, and voice recordings. Yeah. I have a question before we do news and notes. Okay. Do you wish you had this level of documentation of your teen and young adult years? Uh, Absolutely not. No way. way. No way, which is going to be kind of funny for like our kids who are teens now in 30 years. What are they going to look back on? And there's going to be so much content that they had created about their lives. I bet they don't go look look back at it. I bet you're right. But it's also so much their social media content is so much more curated than this was. Fair. You know, she was just constantly filming and mm-hmm. According to her, never looked at it again, just packed it away. Mm -hmm. So they may have kind of a highlight reel of their lives as opposed to the raw, gritty look back. Although maybe looking back, it always is a little raw and gritty. I agree with you. I would not want this, particularly of my teen years. I do not need to relive it. I would rather it just exist in my mind as I remember it. I agree. But I will tell you that watching it has made me feel a little bit nostalgic about revisiting my own teen days in the 90s. Interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. So let's let's start back at the top here. Let me read a little synopsis of what I know you had went over it, but let's read what it is. Right. Sure. Ready. Kid 90 is an intimate look at young Hollywood starlets growing up in the 1990s using hundreds of hours of footage captured by Soleil Moonfry. Now, I think it's fair that we should talk about who Soleil Moonfry is because it dawned on me while I was writing notes like maybe there are people who listen to this podcast who don't know who she is. Sure. Sure. Um, so Soleil Moonfry was a child TV star who found fame as character Punky Brewster in a show of the same name during the 80s from 1984 to 1988. Did you watch Punky Brewster? I did. Like religiously? I mean, it was only on four seasons. I thought it was on a lot longer than that. Was it like appointment TV for you? 1984, I was five. Okay. Holy but... hell. <laughs> but... I do have strong memories of it being a big part of my childhood. Um, it's streaming. The original series is streaming on the Peacock app, and it's streaming on the free version of the Peacock app. So if anybody is interested in going back and watching those, my husband actually did watch the first episode of the show oh last God. night. I have strong memories of the show, Punky and Cherry, being a big part of my life. Maybe you watched it in syndication? It's possible. Um, okay, now I have another question. Did you, you said your husband watched the original episode last night? Yes. Did you watch any of it? I was watching something else at the same time, but I caught that I think maybe she's adopted. She's in like an orphanage. <laughs> Is that what's happening in the beginning? I Okay, so I don't remember specifics of the show. I can't tell you if I in 85, I was 10. I don't know. I may have watched it. I may have not. I mean, obviously, like, I know who Punky Brewster is and was during that time. She was like, she was maybe today's Jojo Siwa. Don't you think so? Yeah, that's a good comparison. Okay. So, uh, she, you know, she was a celebrity on her own, this Punky Brewster character. But um, I had vivid memories this morning while making notes about the opening segment of the show and it had something to do with a grocery store and I was like did she get dropped off in a grocery store or like was she abandoned in a grocery store and then that old guy adopted her like I couldn't remember so I went back and watched it today and it's kind of a dark beginning <laughs> I would she she's so here's Punky Brewster, who at the time may have been seven or eight years old. I don't know how old the character was, but she is asking people who are coming out of the grocery store if she could carry their bags to the car and then getting a tip in exchange for that. And I was like, that is really sad. Like, are these people not realizing, like, maybe this girl is homeless or she needs, like, was she living on the street? Was she in an orphanage but was out? On a day pass, I don't, I don't know what's happening there. I need someone to explain that scenario to me. And then, in also that opening, the old man who ends up adopting her—I can't remember his name. You don't remember it, do you? No. There, he's like walking home. He's a photographer, I think, and he's walking home from work. And there's like a, a homeless man on the street, and he like steps over him. Yeah. I was like, yeah, totally right. I was like, this has not aged well. Mm -hmm. So, not that that was acceptable. Whatever, you know what I mean. So, mm -hmm. anyhow, I didn't have any aspirations to go back and watch the show, but now I'm thinking I might. I do think it gets, once it's Punky Brewster and her dad and her best friend Cherry and her dog, I do think it gets lighter. I saw an article. They show a clip where Buzz Aldrin comes on the show. Yes. And mm -hmm. I saw an article referencing that, which I had forgotten. But the reason he comes on the show is, you know, she's so bereft after the Challenger explosion, which I thought... Which was weren't such we a, all as children, though? Sure. And I, isn't that such a great way to handle it? Like Buzz Aldrin comes on the show and I don't know the role he played, except perhaps to say that I don't I don't I'm not going to speculate. But I think that's a great use of the show. Right. So many kids were so traumatized by this moment that many of them watched live from their classrooms. But I think for the most part, 
it was a pretty light show, but maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Well, that's really interesting because think. let's think of today. What, what children shows, I wouldn't even call this a children's show. I would call it a family TV show, right? Mm-hmm. What family TV shows today in 2021 could do something similar to like what Buzz Aldrin did to address like whatever's going on in in our culture right now? Like, is there anybody coming on TV to talk about Black Lives Matter or um, the pandemic or the election? Anything like that? Are we seeing anything like that in primetime television? Well, are there kids shows in primetime television anymore? I don't know. Family shows. I think this is a family show. I agree, but uh, I don't know. Somewhat, you know, right in. I honestly, off the top of my head, having not prepared for this answer, can't think of a family show that's on in primetime. Again, so much of our shows are streaming now, but Mm -hmm. can you think of a currently airing family show? The only one that comes to mind is Blackish on ABC. That's a good example. They do a good job of handling current events. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. The other one I can only think of is the Goldbergs, but that's set in the 80s, so they're not going to be talking about current day situations. Well, here is the question. Should there be more family TV shows? Yeah, (laughs) that's... Gone are the days of uh, family ties, family matters, right? Right. When we sit down, so we watch a lot of TV together as a family, and we are watching old shows. We're watching Family Matters. We're working our way through that. We watch things like Full House. I don't think that category of programming is prominent anymore. Yeah. I mean, if we're missing it, like Megan said, uh, send us an email, Megan and Wendy at gmail.com. Cause I need we're to more be... likely to watch like reality television as a family, like a show like Nailed It or American Idol, that yeah. kind of. Yeah competition show as type opposed show to a scripted show mm-hmm. yeah i mean i'm kind of longing for a family show i think me too yeah okay so let's talk about the documentary kid 90 do you have some news and notes for this show well i have a couple things that i read okay one was that she didn't intend for it to be so personal i think she kind of went into it they were going to dive in to all this material and as time does it kind of blurs your memory of what life was like And I think when she went into it, I don't think her intent was that it was going to be such an in-your-face look at how intense their life was. And Mm -hmm. I did not expect that. And the other thing that I thought was really interesting is she said she did not notify everyone who was in this documentary in advance of it airing. Oh, that's I had wondered that. She She, said she's talking about those who were not in talking head interviews, right? Correct. Okay. Because there were many, many people in this documentary who appear, some of them very briefly. But she said, look, I, the interview I saw, she said, I was recording them. They knew they were being recorded. And so they were not all notified prior to this airing. And I'm very curious if there's any fallback. I'm very curious, fall too. Fall out. Have, fall out. You haven't heard any, uh, you haven't seen any interviews from, let's say, like Leonardo DiCaprio, who f- was featured in it. Or um, Charlie Sheen. Although it's interesting. Charlie that- Sheen. I have so many thoughts. We'll get there. I do there. too. He was painted in a very positive light, which was very interesting. And so was Leonardo DiCaprio. You know, first, I can't imagine he would come back and say, oh, yeah, I was a cute kid even then. Right. What's he going to say? He was not yeah. painted as in the light that some of the other people were shown. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's all I have. What other news and notes do you have? I don't have any specific news and notes, but I do have a few reviews from IMDb. Awesome. Which I was a little bit surprised. There were so many in there. Um, These are just little quotes. I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, It was a mixed bag. So the first one, cool footage, but got boring quick. Quote, another poor little rich kid story. Oh, Quote, very candid, extremely well done. Quote, just spent 90 minutes with someone while they waxed nostalgic over their old photo albums. End quote. I kind of relate to the entire mixed bag of those comments. I I had so many thoughts watching this. And should we jump to our first impressions? Yeah, let's do that. Go ahead. So my first and overall impression, having watched this show, is it left me feeling 
depressed overall. I found it to be a heavy show to watch. And I took me three sittings to get through the show. And I watched it's only an hour and 10 minutes. I watched the final 20 minutes last night in bed. And of course, it ends Mm -hmm. with this montage of all of her friends who have died. And I needed to watch something else. So I turned on Grey's Anatomy because I'm trying to catch up on the current season. And I watched an episode in which Meredith Grey is very sick with COVID-19. Spoiler alert. And it doesn't end with any sort of resolution. So then I needed to watch another show. So I turn on my standby, Superstore, which always is a great show to fall asleep to. And one of the employees is detained by ICE. So at that point, I gave up and decided I just needed to go to bed. There was no redeeming this evening for me. It was just the downhill spiral for you, it huh? It was. Oh, I'm sorry. What um, did you think? My first impressions were I expected something very different. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, though, I thought it fell flat. I thought it was too vague at times. And I thought that it she could have like drilled down into some of the topics they were exploring with a little more depth. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, it it's it's certainly not feel good. That's for sure. No. Yeah. Did you like anything about it? Um, I did like a lot about. It. I feel like okay, like you said, I feel very mixed bag about it. There mm-hmm. were some highlights for me that things that I really liked, and then there was a lot of things I didn't really like about it. I thought. Let me let me propose this to you. Do you think that this would have maybe? Not made more sense, but maybe we could have got more out of it if it was like a short series. Done the way that this was done? No, because I don't think they were interested in giving you any extra information. Yeah, interesting. Like you said, it was so vague. It wasn't like they tried to do too much. For me, they tried to do too little. Oh, interesting. I, I left kind of confused at the end of the documentary because I was like, what was she trying to accomplish here? Um, at first, it kind of just seemed like they were, you know, maybe exploring some some topics, but then they never it never comes full circle. And then towards the end, it's like she's trying just to confirm with these people that her memories are accurate of things that had happened during this time period. Um, I was like, what? What? What's the goal here? That's what I left the the show watching. Like, what was the goal here and was it accomplished? Did you have any feelings about that? I don't know the purpose of this show other than it just with a comment that you read the review that said this was like looking through her old, old photo albums. It would be like if I invited you over and was like, here, look at all these photos from college. And there's all these people that you don't know and don't really care about. And yes, there were celebrities in there, but so, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the things we wished about section. I just felt like I wasn't that interested in the story in the way they were telling it. I didn't oh. really need to live this Soleil's childhood experience again in the way she was telling it. There was, it was uncomfortable to watch an hour and 10 minutes of badly filmed footage. (laughs) Tiresome. Yes. 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 She, you know, reading your old diary entries gives me serious secondhand embarrassment, particularly because she was really feeling herself in those moments as she was reading them. Like for her, those were really profound moments and that was not my feeling as she was reading them. So, I'm a very Debbie Downer when it comes to this show, but I just, it didn't, it didn't do it for me. All right. All right. So if it didn't do it for you, was there anything that you liked about it? Well, I liked seeing how as a teen, you know, she was very outspoken about body issues and over-sexualization of teenagers. And I thought that was very interesting to see, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, when that was maybe not being talked about as much as openly. And I was really impressed with the level to which she was committed to filming everything Mm -hmm. and could only imagine the commitment to digging into these hundreds of hours of footage. Whoever edited this is an absolute saint. I thought about that. (laughs) 
I thought whoever got dumped all these VHS tapes was like, uh, okay, where do I start? Right. <laughs> Holy hell. Yeah. So I agree. <clears throat> I really enjoyed that she, not enjoyed, I appreciated that she talked about her struggle with body image, especially being so young and developing so early and how she was so sexualized at such a young age. And then really went to the, at the time, I think went to such an extreme to change her body because she wanted to be seen as this, you know, of who she actually, her true self. Um, And she was young, only 15 when she had that breast reduction surgery. Yeah, really young. I like that. I um, also appreciated that she was very candid and spoke about um, what are we, sexual trauma she experienced Mm -hmm. um but then reflecting back to it i i wondered if it was necessary to the overall story that she was trying to tell i don't i i don't know if it was like could that have been left out or did she feel that it was profound to her story that she shared that she was a victim of assault well i think the thing that was important was the way her the way she looked at it changed looking back on it when she read those journal entries that she had written about it i think changed the way she thought about the experience as an adult now as opposed to as a 16 17 year old at the time you know it made it the way she wrote about it she said well it was my fault too mm-hmm. so i think having the chance to go back and look at it and say, no, that wasn't okay. And now I can own that that wasn't okay. I think that was maybe the part because there's not a lot of growth in this. There's not a lot of, which I actually kind of appreciated. She's not apologizing for it. She's not apologizing for the rampant drug use and the life that they live. She does say she has some regret that she didn't see how in pain some of her friends are, but she's not really apologizing for her behavior. And I do like that. It's not a, she's not rewriting history. Well, agree. Um, I think that we all experience this, those kind of things growing up as a, you're experimenting with things, you're, um, maybe doing you know pushing the boundaries a little bit uh i just think that with these kids who lived in like this entertainment industry or this hollywood lifestyle or whatever um maybe had a little bit more freedom to do that kind of of stuff well Um, and you saw her mother her mother was obviously very free-spirited her father was not a strong parental influence in her life so she had a lot of freedom to live this way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which, yeah, where were their parents is my question throughout this entire thing. Yeah. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to like, you know, what's that saying? Armchair expert. It <laughs> like, sure. you know, I'm not going to, I was a teen in the nineties too and did stupid shit and uh, made a lot of errors and have lots of regrets. But um, I'm not going to sit back now and be like, where were their parents at? Because I did the same stuff, you know? I don't know. I just think it's, I just think that those are parts of like the story that are like, well, are, is any of that stuff relevant to like what you're trying to accomplish here? Whole thing the only thing I think mess. she was trying to accomplish was to give an accurate look through these videos at what their life was really like. I don't think there's a lesson uh huh. I think it's just this is what it is, and we're showing you what it was like. Okay, but isn't that super narcissistic and self indulgent? Yes, I, yeah, yes. Right. I think the whole thing was so self indulgent, and yeah. particularly when she layered it with reading her personal diary entries, because uh-huh. at, you could make the argument that it was, hey, this is what was life was like for these young adults in the nineties. Yes, it was through her lens, but she wasn't the star of many of those videos. But then when you layer it with her diary entries, it makes it, I think, very self-indulgent. But hey, yeah. someone was willing to pay her for this and the timing worked out because her Punky Brewster reboot is out. So right. Right. there's something to be said for making it work. Well, it- then that starts to make me question, like, uh, what's the, 
Is that the, is, was that the angle? Was that, here, I have all these videos of all these big stars and I'm going to sh- make a documentary about it now. And by the way, I have a new show coming out. So let's get some, you know, chatter happening about Soleil Moonfry. I would b- easily believe that that's part of the motivation. And I think also... When you think Soleil Moonfry, I think Punky Brewster, and then I have no information in my brain about her from the age of nine or how 12, however old she was, until now she's an adult starring in this reboot. You may remember a few years ago she had a mommy blog. <laughs> yes, I was just I was just typing this up because I thought for a minute there. Okay, if you guys don't know the backstory of Megan and I, we both had mommy blogs uh, in the mid 2000s um and she was kind of dipping her toe into that community if i recall correctly i I don't know if she wanted like freelance writers or i was a writer for her site you were way to bury the lead megan i honestly maybe wrote once i can't even remember what it was called but between soleil moonfry as a child and soleil moonfry reinventing herself as a blogger i didn't know I have no information about her. Yeah. And I think this was like, hey, I was a person who existed. Here's my backstory. Get interested in me. This is why you should care about me. Soleil Moonfry, former child star. I didn't fall off the planet for the past 35 years. I'm cool. <laughs> the I'm audience cool. of the Punky Brewster reboot are Gen Xers like you and I uh-huh. who remember fondly Punky Brewster as a part of their childhood. Is there anything else you liked about this? No, what did you wish for? Um, like I have said many times throughout this episode, I wished that they would have explored some of the topics that they were doing a drive-by on. Like, you know, sexualization of young girls in entertainment, rejection of uh, at work, you know, as, as growing up in Hollywood or working in the entertainment industry. Like, what effect did that have on... These young actors, um, there was even one scene that Mark Paul, how do you say his last name? Gosler. Yeah. So he had spoke about how he was told that this was, you know, as a child actor, that this is an adult industry. This is an adult business. You have to act like an adult. And therefore, this is the reason why he won't let his kids work in the business. And I was like, what does all that mean exactly? Like, right. say more about that. Say more about that. Yeah, that's exactly what I wrote. Talk more about that. Like, yeah, that's what I want to hear. That's the stuff I want to hear, because then I think you op- really open Pandora's box about how dark the industry is for child actors and the effects they have on them. They go on to talk forever and ever and ever and eulogize her friends who either committed suicide or there were drug overdoses. And I'm not saying that maybe there was some mental instability there, but w- let's look at the root cause of why, why these people were so unhappy. Yeah, what was going on? Let's tell the real story. Yes! They could have dug so much deeper with those interviews. They had Mark Paul Gosler. They had Brian Austin Green. You have David Arquette. These people are deep in the entertainment industry, and they spent the entire time just navel-gazing and talking about their relationship with Soleil and what life was like. No, let's talk about, okay, life was like this. What did that mean? Right? I mean, David Arquette said, like, basically, I'm lucky that I didn't die based on the number of drugs that I did. Okay. Uh Uh What? Which is what got say you there? more about this. Yeah. Yeah. What was the path there? Why is this such a thing for these child stars in the 80s and 90s and maybe it's a thing now right but why why all of these people are dead why take us back right and i'm 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 not convinced but i am theorizing that a lot of it has to do with rejection at such a tender age you know you remember being a tween or a teen and how hard it was and then to be in the spotlight where they have some, um, you know, popularity or success. And then to be like, well, let's say Soleil Moonfry, right? She talked about she was su- successful in Punky Brewster. Did she have any paying job, any movie career after that? 
not really. So what does that do to her? Where could it have gone? That's the that's what I want to watch. Well, and there was no discussion of mental health Mm -hmm. 20, 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. We talk, you know, in 2021, people talk about going to therapy all the live long day. People talk about being medicated. It's an open conversation. We can talk about it. There's no shame in it. But there was no discussion of mental health and there was no discussion of getting help. And the idea of your child, your teenager needing some sort of mental health intervention would have at that time, been viewed as a failing on the part of a parent that would have been viewed as a big problem. Whereas now kids go to therapy, no big deal. It's just like going to the doctor, right? Mm -hmm. So they weren't getting any help. Nobody was going to therapy regularly. Nobody was being prescribed antidepressants at that age. So let's talk about that and how that's changed and how or what happened when you right but what happened if you if your parents saw that you were struggling if your friends saw that you were struggling if you said that you were struggling some of these people in these videos i don't remember the name of the person but he said i'm not I'm not really enjoying things here i'm going to move on somewhere else i mean it's very clearly saying like i'm done with this life mm-hmm. but when your friends say that to you what happened then or did nobody do anything yeah i'm just wondering if you don't if if their if peers did not have the awareness that I think maybe kids have today, right? In those kind of scenarios, right? Yikes! Yikes! So my wish is a little bit lighter, but in that same vein, I wanted more information. You mentioned when we talked on our episode about the Oprah interview with Harry and Meghan, which is a bonus episode on our Patreon. You can get access to you said i wish they had a pop-up video style information just telling me more telling me more every time they mention something i felt that so deeply because every once in a while a name would pop up on the screen but i don't have great recall so i'm thinking oh yeah remind me what this person was in remind me what they did because then i in the beginning i was like well i need to google these people and then i just got over it so like jenny lewis Yeah. My brain didn't go right to Troop Beverly Hills, which is, of course, where my deepest memory of her is. But tell us that Jenny Lewis was one of the stars of Troop Beverly Hills, which is getting a reboot. Like, tell us these things. Yeah. Because I felt like I was so distracted by, oh, I know that person. Remind me what they were in. My brain needs to know the information. Right. I I know that person. How are they connected? How does Soleil know this person? Why are they friends? I wanted all that information. Yeah, I did the same with Jonathan Brandis. I was like, I remember yes. his face, and but I didn't know if he was dead or not. And so I had to Google it. I Googled a ton of people in this. Um, that's where I thought, d- definitely, I agree with you, like a pop-up scenario. This is because we need all the information at one time. This is why I want those pop-up information things. But that was one of my critiques of the documentary is that she would sometimes show the name of who it was. And then sometimes wouldn't. She -hmm. talked about this girl, Shannon, and how Shannon was in a very bad car crash and then ended up killing herself. Well, who the hell is Shannon? Like, she never, they never showed the name. Nothing. At the very end. Did you see that? I did. But But, but at that point, I didn't care because I wrote in my notes, Shannon who? mm -hmm. And then at the end, they showed her last name. And at that point, I was, the move. it was over. I was done. I was not, I was done Googling. I wasn't invested anymore. But I thought the same thing. You're going to tell me, Shannon, you're going to pop up on the screen that she then wrapped her car around a tree and shoots herself in the head. Mm -hmm. Who is this person? Yep. Give me a reason beyond she's a human. I'm interested in her story, but remind me why you're telling me about her. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Did you have anything else you wished for? That's it. Okay, let's talk about, did you see that? And I only have one very, very big note here. Charlie Sheen. Yes, Charlie freaking Sheen. First of all, I had to Google him to see how old he was. And then I Googled Soleil Moonfry to see what the age difference is between the two. It's like 11 years, is that right? 11 years, yes. Are we, did we do the same research? (laughs) Well, because now she's what, 44, 45? Yep. So, okay. Let's say they were to meet each other now. She's 44. He's 55. Fine. That doesn't raise an alarm bell for me. She's 17 and he's 27, 28. That's a big problem for me. I agree. And what's interesting is, did she ever say that she was talking about Charlie Sheen? Now, we know she's talking about Charlie Sheen. She plays his 
voice recordings over the story that she's telling about this man. But does she ever say that's who it is? She never names him specifically, but it's very obvious. They talk about how she um, went to a Yankees game with him. And in the very end, they show a picture of the two of them at a Yankees game. Uh, Well, if you Google Kid 90, Charlie Sheen, a hundred articles come up saying, yeah. So Lay Moon Fry discusses her relationship with Charlie Sheen. And I felt like it was very obvious. That's who she's talking about. She talks about him. And then there's these voicemails that he's leaving her. She has a very positive memory of him. Of being in love with him. And how how good he he was to her. Yeah. Yeah. But in 2021, we know Charlie Sheen. Not a good guy very problematic. So all the alarm bells were going off for me because if I don't rem- I don't know if she said specifically how old she was when she went to New York, but I'm saying at the most 16 or 17, he is a man near 30 at this point and he's having a sexual relationship with a minor. Is that not a problem? Well, and I do think I think she says She loses her virginity at 17. I think that's what she says. It's to Charlie Sheen. And then she goes to New York. I think she says she's going for college at one point. I don't know that she ever goes to school. But I think she's 18 when she moves to New York. Not that that makes a difference. She's still very much a child. He's 28, 29 years old at that point. Right. She was 17 when they began having a relationship. I have a problem with that on the Charlie Sheen side of it. I do, too. I think it's just... gross (laughs) gross <laughs> i Took agree it I, nicely <laughs> I, that made me very uncomfortable mm-hmm. and i found it fascinating that even now as an adult she has these rose colored colored glasses on about that relationship well yeah because don't you think that there's no perspective she's not sharing any perspective of like now I could see how that could be problematic. Right. She doesn't even address it. I was 17. He was an adult man. No. Yeah. She just, he was so good to her and so kind to her. And she had these loving feelings about losing her virginity to him. And he would treat her so well. He was her Mr. Big. And I just wrote yowzers. (laughs) Yeah. That was my big note of, did you see that? Did you have any, anything else? I have a couple little things. One, did you see the huge number of Adidas duffel bags in this documentary? No, no, not at all. That's such a nostalgic thing for me. It is so funny because my husband still has an Adidas duffel bag that he uses for like an overnight bag, for like a weekend uh-huh. trip. And that it, it's such like a callback to my uh, young adult days. Like that would be like the kind of duffel bag you would use. For a weekend trip. Anyway, that's a very personal one. But there was a ton of them. They were constantly. There were some scenes that just made my eyes bug out of my head. Like when they're driving down the road, hanging out the windows of their cars, like sitting on the windowsill. I was full blown panicked for them. As a parent. it's Yeah, it is hard to watch it through the helicopter parent lens. I mean, you never did that as a kid. You never no, did stupid that's shit like that. what was the Come hardest on! No, I was not this kind of teenager. I have never touched an illicit drug in my entire life. I didn't drink in high school. I didn't smoke a thing. So for me, this is so far outside of my young adult experience. I didn't even do this stuff in college. I never did. So it's it's not a nostalgic look for me. Uh huh. I would say okay. I did stupid stuff like I like I said. Um. I thought this, like, was beyond my comfort zone as a teenager in the 90s. Like, I was, like, a a good kid who dabbled here and there trying to fit in. It wasn't like I was, like, a full-blown, like, you know, stoner playing hacky sack on the lawn at school or anything. But um, shout out 90s. If, if that's not a 90s visual, I don't know what is. So that's where I felt nostalgic. Like, I had friends and peers who were doing all that stuff you know so i that's what feels very nostalgic to me that the time the music i don't know if you noticed but the soundtrack was really good and the score was done by linda perry do you know who linda perry is no she's like a prolific um songwriter Mm -hmm. and producer she's done a ton of stuff but um yeah i was kind of impressed that she got uh such an 
musical icon to do the score for this. And also, side note, I don't know if you noticed, but I think the EP on this was Sean Penn. Oh, interesting. I didn't pay attention to that. Yeah, but I haven't seen any like uh, any any kind of articles or anything on that. I just noticed his name. and I was like, was that like, is that the Sean Penn? And the last thing I had in, did you see that was a funny moment? They're driving in a car and um, there were two cars driving next to each other. And one of the guys goes, oh, I beeped him. I want him to call me back and have to pay for the call. And man, (laughs) if you were a person with a cell phone in the late 90s, you know that feeling. (laughs) Right. I did think it was funny. There were so many voicemail messages like on an answering machine. Uh And I thought, you know, they were like, hey, where are you? You're not home. Okay, I'll find you later or whatever. It's like, yes. How did you guys how did we get a hold of each other with just the answering machine? Did you ever have a pager? No, never, never. I did. Oh, of course you did. Because what? Were you dealing drugs? No, I don't know. That's such a terrible stereotype. Everybody did. All of my friends did. Okay. Um, Well, okay. That's fair because our age difference is five years. So this makes sense. Like if you were in high school, you, Megan, you probably did have a pager at that time. I will never forget when I was a senior in high school, I graduated in 1993. There was a girl that I hung around and she got one of those new Fandagle cell phones. And it was the size of a freaking brick. It was so (laughs) huge. And I will never forget. We went to a, you know, a high school house party on a Friday night and she's standing there with like a solo cup in one hand and this huge ass phone in the other. <laughs> it was like, what are you doing with that? But Everybody wasn't calling anybody because n- nobody had one. <laughs> nobody had one. But it was like because she was like, oh, my parents need to get a hold of me or some crap like that. It was oh. like everybody, you know, is here. And right. OK, if your parents need to get a hold of you, then all right, I, I get it. But like, come on. <laughs> I mean, I have fond memories of like coming home from high school. Like I had my own phone line in my room with its own answering machine and like coming home to listen to all the messages of people who called. Like that was very exciting. Did you rate this movie? I didn't, but I can. This is the, what are you comparing it to? Nothing. Itself. The Britney Spears documentary. Oh, that was excellent. People should definitely watch that. Agree. Uh, I will leave a link to it in the show notes because it's available on Hulu, I think. It was a news program, right? Right. It was an episode of a New York Times series. Right. I'm giving this two stars. That's exactly what I gave it. I wrote, not a fun, nostalgic look back. I wanted I Love the 90s and I got an existential crisis. (laughs) You need to write for IMDb (laughs) ASAP. Do you remember VH1's I Love the 90s? I love that show. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. That's what I was hoping for. That sort of feeling. Yeah. That's what I thought it was going to be. Me too. Um, and then I I told you, and I think on our other podcast that I had uh, watched the trailer and I was like, nope, I don't want to watch this right now. That looks too depressing. Right. And it, and it is. Um, I want to just, as a side note, I watched the Billie Eilish documentary that's available on Apple+. Plus. And a, a very different documentary, but that was a lot better than this one. Oh, good to know. A lot better. Oh, I forgot what I wa- that I wanted to say that, but it's okay. Never mind. What? What? It's... That this kid ninety was basically an e true Hollywood story, but not as well done. But not as well done. Yeah. At least the e true Hollywood story, you get the voiceover discussing what's happening. This is true. You know, she directed this. So maybe like her direction wasn't that great. I just wanted more. (laughs) Yeah, me too. Um, And also less. (laughs) (laughs) I wanted something entirely different. I did not want this this. at all. (laughs) Give me back Hallmark. I did Uh, find it interesting that Danny O'Connor is just like living in Tulsa. Just living. That's the other thing I was going to say. Yeah. I mean, is he? I wanted more information about what's happening in his life. (laughs) Well, because he says, like, you know, we were drug addicts. Yeah. But, like, are you clean now? What are you doing in your... What is your life like, Danny? Like, why do we just get five minutes of a walk and talk and, like, hey, I coach soccer here in Tulsa. What are you doing? Yeah. Why why is there no information? Yeah. Yeah. I thought so, too. I mean, because... 
like that was like a huge one hit wonder song for them, right? Stills good 30 years later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought it was weird. And I thought like all that stuff, was, she was kind of like goo goo gaga over in him a little bit. I thought like, look, she wanted, I am sorry, but this felt like she just wanted all of these people to tell her what great friends they were. Yeah. 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 It's like, tell me, tell me how great our time was together and how happy you are to see me. Uh huh. I want that too. I'm just not going to put it on Hulu. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. We will be back next week, back to Hallmark, discussing chasing waterfalls, which fun tie in, you know, 90s, the 90s music. Yes. Music. Yes. So come back for that. And again, before you go, you can join us on Instagram, Megan and Wendy LSS, or our Facebook group, Long Story Shorties. Or if you love this podcast, MeganandWendy.com slash Apple Podcast will take you directly to where you need to go to leave us a review. Until then, have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. (laughs) 